Okay, hello, um, viewers. <laughs> I'm Kira. This is the, I guess, the ninth uh, meeting of the Visual Tools Group for closure from the uh, closure sort of data science world. And we're going to go ahead with a few presentations of projects that are going on in the community, things that people are working on that they want to share. So we've got a little more than an hour. So maybe we'll aim for like 10 to 15 minutes if, if, uh, you could sort of roughly aim for that. That'd be great. I think we've got four people hoping to go. So um, yeah, I guess, unless there's someone who's like dying to go first, maybe we could start with Marcus, if that makes sense. And yeah, so yeah, keep that in mind, maybe like 10 to 15 minutes or maybe 10 and then five minutes to discuss or whatever. Um, and usually we, you know, people are free to stick around as long as you want after to continue talking and stuff, but we try to aim to wrap up around, um, 90 minute mark so um yeah feel free to share your screen or not or do okay. uh do whatever. well yeah i need to share my screen to show you cloj tiles cool so, cool. so um yeah CLJ tiles. I gave a talk at uh, reclosure in December, and uh, I'll I'll start the same way as I did there to give you kind of an introduction what it is. So um, I start with some of the lyrics. Um, you see, come get around people, uh, which is a string and therefore a valid closure program, so you can run it and you see the result come get around people. The next, of course, you can print more than one line wherever you roam and admit that the waters. And now comes the, the feature, the main feature of CLJ ties. You have to complete the poem, the lyrics. So if you, if you now run this program, you don't get this nice uh, scrolling in of the text, you get the result of a program. Um, but if you complete it um, in the right way, um, you have grown and accepted that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. And then you run it, you, the, the lyrics are coming in quite nicely. So notice here, uh, what we are doing here is completing all lines of the lyrics. Um, but if we go on, like here, we have, we have also words. Um, come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen and keep your eyes wide. The chance won't come again and don't speak too soon. So if it's not finished, you run the program, you get kind of the output, which is here spin, which is the last expression. And you also see the code here. But if you complete it, the wheel still in spin, you get a nice result. So that's basically the, the gist of CLJ types. You have some, some blocks floating around, some puzzles, and you complete it. And um, the the whole thing is about completing closure code, which, which we come here, which is proper closure code. You can complete it here, run it, uh, complete it in any way you want. And as you can see here, the, the result can be anything and there will be no feedback whether what you did is correct or not, because you, uh, you just have a puzzle and play around with it. Um, and most of the puzzles which you encounter in CLJ tiles are just puzzles without any feedback. Um, but there is, there are some which have a description like this one. Um, this, this here is already an example using the Signutils package, which is which is a uh, algebraic mathematical package for closure, and so you can do symbolic computation with it. And and here it says, okay, you have to sum up two vectors, 
one, three, five. And then it should be zero, which is sine of pi. If you know some math, it's always zero. Um, and then you see square root of four is two. And then you see here, the result should be one, five, nine. Okay. Well, you see the result is one, five, nine, but you can do it in a more sophisticated manner and have a nice tech equation. So, um, Basically, you saw there are puzzles which have no requirement for how to solve them. Then sometimes you get the reward for solving them correctly. Sometimes you have a description. Um, and I, I thought, well, um, having a description is, is a very nice way of uh, going on with the puzzles. And then there came out um, the book by Sam Ritchie, which is the book of Sussman, but he translated it to, into org mode. So there, there is a book from, from uh, Gerald Sussman and Jack Wisdom, which is called Functional Differential Geometry. And this is book is open access and you can access it as a, as a PDF. Maybe I open it. So you can see. You can see how it looks like. Okay, so it's open access and you, you, you can download it. And what uh, Sam Ritchie did, he translated it into an org mode file, which is here. Okay, so he took, he took this book and uh, Translated. If you if you look at the raw code, it looks like this. Okay, so you have chapter one with all the things and the code. So I thought, well, um, here I get the description for free, and and since there is the code, well, I can make puzzles out of it. So um, I wrote some code to import the org file. You see here, you get you get the URL. In principle, this could be any URL, so you can load any org file. Question is, if it if it properly loads, um, because I, I tailor made the code to load this one, but in principle you can try and or write your own if you want. Um, yeah, and this is it. You see here it's the same. You see the introduction, and if when whenever uh, the code appears in the org file. It is displayed as a workspace, as graphical blocks. And you can click through, say, okay. And the next feature is um, you in, in, in the first workspace, you see the solution. You see the code as blocks. But if you go on, uh, you only see puzzles. The idea here is that uh, if, you, if you don't solve, the code, you don't get the description. So if you solve it, uh, you get the puzzle, and then you solve it. Okay, 0.5 mass. This here is not so easy to understand. You need to know a little bit of physics or quite quite some kind of physics to solve it. But uh, it's doable. Like this, L3, okay, mass. And the, the new feature uh, I implemented is this Wordle-like coloring. So if you, if you do a block correctly and you press color here, you see it's, it's becoming green. So for example, here, okay, the above block here is correct. Um, but this one isn't, this function here isn't quite finished, but if you complete it correctly, it's colored green in full. And if you solve the puzzle completely correct and color it, then the whole thing is green, which tells you, okay, you did it right. And then you can go on and say, show me the next one. And now you see not the puzzle like you would see in all the others, 
but the full solution with the description so you can read it, try to understand it, and again, get the puzzle in solved. Um, of course, the, the idea for all this is coming from Wordle, right? So in Wordle, you do some, ah, that's not, that's not good. What would be a good word here? What do we start with? Um, I usually start with story. 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 Okay. Yeah. So you see, it's it's ah the black thing. We we don't have we don't have a green one. But I think you uh, you know what uh, how how world works. It it has this black and golden and also green colors for being right or not in the in the correct place. And that, that was the idea for, for CLJ Tides, um, to, to help you kind of uh, get in feedback for the code uh, you, you compile. Um, there is one trick, um, because if you, if you solve one puzzle, all the other uh, puzzles coming before get unlocked. So if you, if you don't want to solve all the puzzles in the, in the order and want the whole solution, I was graceful and at the end of the chapter, I added a very, very simple puzzle. You just have to color it and solve it. And all of a sudden everything is unlocked. So that's a little trick. And then you get the whole, the whole book basically as blocks and, and then you can solve it. Um, this is really cool. Just in the interest of time, if we can maybe wrap up in like four or five minutes, we can uh, move on. But if it, anyone, like if you have anything you want to wrap up or if you want to leave it open for questions, up to you. Oh, well, um, there, is, there is one thing I'd like to add, which is here, you see, you see it, is, it is puzzle by puzzle. Um, and I figured, well, it would be an, an, an advancement of all this would be if you, if we had whole workspaces. So I created another example, um, which shows whole workspaces like, like this. Okay, go to the end, go back, same trick, and unlock everything. And here, I, I think one improvement is Having having all workspaces, see part of every particle, and it doesn't go away. So the, the whole workspace is developed, and you can. I, th I think it it's, it it has a better a better storytelling than having having the book which only shows one example after the other. And one thing, let me add one thing is um, here you can as well have a, a black element because if you don't create the puzzles out of the original code, but curate the puzzle, you can add elements which are not there in the original, which is here, for example, the path of the free particle. So we also have black elements, green, yellow, and black elements here. Um, yeah, to, to wrap it up, basically, um, I think it's, it's a new way of, of uh, telling the story about how to evolve some code and uh, a new way to, to present books and make them interactive, actually. Yeah. Yeah, this is cool. I do have one question. Um, I'm curious who the sort of like main target audience that you had in mind was making this. It reminds me of, um, what's that called, like Scratch or something that MIT put out a long time ago for like teaching kids how to program with drag and drop. It kind of feels like that, but it also feels like it's a little more advanced. Well, um, Scratch is more an environment where you create programs. Right. And I, I had a version, the first version of all this was like this, and I figured it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit for blocks. Um, and what I'm doing here is called Parsons puzzle in the computer science community. I didn't know that until I was giving the talk for reclosure and I, I asked Katie Fiesler, she's a professor and she 
as well had a talk there. And she was kind enough to hint me that what I'm doing is Parsons puzzles. That's so, cool. and, and she's, and, and that's it, you, you give, and the most important thing about, about Parsons puzzles is, for example, in, um, in Python, you have this, there are Parsons puzzles for Python and you, you only have lines, right? And what we, so this, what you see here is kind of what Python already does. But what we have here in, uh, in Clojure is we also have expressions, like really sub-expressions. And this is, I think, what, what adds to the whole, to the whole subject, that uh, using Clojure and Parsons puzzles is, is a real great fit. Um, cool. And the target audience um, is really, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it's fine with, if it's like just me. <laughs> <laughs> No, the, the, the thing is really, it, it works best for this, uh, for these books by, by Sussman because the, the closure code in there is, is so, fits so nicely. It is a small, succinct uh, way of programming. Um, and and uh, when, the, when the programs grow and grow and I try different examples, it, it's, the, the workspace uh, starts to get crowded. So uh, the target audience is really to understand this, this uh, FTG book, which actually I wrote it, I wrote it for myself starting it because I, I read the book and uh, I had to install Clojure and I didn't have any idea how to, how to program in Clojure. And I was on a Windows machine and it was 2015 and it was really cumbersome to get all the things running. Mm. And so I thought, well, maybe it would be better to, to have a kind of a UI because as a, uh, so the main target audience is armchair physicists in this <laughs> um, who, who, who the, mostly they don't know GitHub. Uh, they don't know how they, they use notepads plus plus or something and, and don't have an idea about REPL or something. And neither yeah. did I at that time. Uh, and that's why that's why I, I wrote it. Uh, it's always so, so, so things like this, I think, always come a bit out of a pain situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's always the best way is fixing yeah. your own problem. That's really cool. Exactly. Well, thanks so much for sharing. Um, we could take a couple minutes if anyone else wants to like comment or ask questions. There'll be time at the end as well, if there's anything pressing. If not, uh, maybe we could go on to Victor. Yeah. If that's all right. That Take a similar fine. amount of time, like 10, 15 minutes or yeah. thereabouts. Uh, we will see if it will be too fast or too, too slow. You got to tell me yeah, if, yeah. if I should slow down. Uh, all right, I'll keep it out of time for you. Yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go. Here we go. Um, so, all of you already know what Clojure is, so I'm not going to explain what that is. Uh, but in case you're not familiar with Obsidian, it's uh, what some people would call like knowledge base uh, editor or such. It's basically just a, a text editor that allows you to, to do links between your documents. So kind of like a wiki, uh, but with some more facilitation to, to either run it locally or they specialize in, in other things. In terms of Obsidian, uh, what makes it different uh, than the other kind of knowledge base uh, things is that you run it locally. So it's a, it's a local application on my, on my computer and it's all markdown files. All the files that you're creating are just normal markdown files and it has a plugin ecosystem as well. Um, so what I use Obsidian for is that I'm, I'm doing my daily journaling, I'm, I'm creating the initial sketches of the ideas I have, or I uh, keep track of my to-dos, or stuff I want to learn, or stuff that I have learned. Basically, just all the information that I, I sit with goes down into Obsidian at one point or another. Um, so what I quickly found out was that I want, I want Obsidian to kind of like do more. So it's cool we have plugins, but then I have to write one plugin each time I want to like add custom behavior. Uh, so what I figured uh, I actually want is a custom, like a runtime inside of Obsidian where I can just put ideally closure code and make Obsidian do stuff uh, for me. Uh, so what I wrote is this uh, thing I called uh, Obsidian Wielder uh, because it wields the power of closure inside of Obsidian. 
Um, so now if you, if you put a code block uh, inside our Obsidian documents, uh, when you're viewing it, uh, you would evaluate that code. And, and that's like the main idea, right? So you can write any, any closure code that you would normally be able to. You can define new bars and, and call functions and stuff like that. Uh, you could also render text if you don't like this ugly uh, different styling. So now it just looks like normal text here, but it's not actually part of the, of the document. Uh, you could also render HTML. So Obsidian is, is based on, on Electron, so everything is JavaScript and HTML and CSS. So you can also render bottoms. And then I started thinking, well, if we can render HTML, we should be able to render like reagent, reagent stuff as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna, let's see, evaluate. Um, so we can do reagent stuff as well. So you can see that there is, there is hiccup, hiccup data. And finally, there is a, a component that is being rendered here. Let's see, it seems I broke something with my, with my final changes. Um, but the idea here is that you have uh, interactive, interactive components. Uh, so let's see if we can figure out why this is not working. Target, that should be fine. I am not sure why that is not working. I can use a uh, website, maybe because it's a bit more stable. Um, see go down to the bottom so the website is is published from obsidian it's exactly the same uh, but it's running directly in the browser um, so i'm rendering the the application here and now i have a, a functioning app directly in my in my obsidian uh, vault as they call it uh, so in general, like everything that works in Clojure uh, works, is is run via C or Psi. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, but this uh, Borg dude uh, library for running Clojure code in a bunch of different environments. Uh, so most things works. It also prints out errors. What I haven't gotten to work is some extra functionality like the doc uh, function, for example, would be nice to have as well. Um, there is, see, so change back to the desktop application. Um, so Obsidian has a plugin API as well. Um, and you can access whatever you have in Obsidian, you could access with Wielder as well. So we can see here, for example, that I'm, I'm calculating the amount of files I have in my current vault. And then I'm, I'm doing this little pipe character here, and it would uh, render the text. So this text here is dynamic, depending on how many pages I actually have in my, in my vault. Um, so a bit more uh, of the Obsidian integration, like you can, you can run the commands as well uh, that you have in, in, uh, in Obsidian. I am not sure what I changed in the code base, like just before this call that, that broke these things. Uh, but for example, you will be able to open like this switcher or the file switcher and, and stuff like that. Uh, there is some drawbacks to the, to the approach that I have uh, done here. Uh, for example, I haven't quite solved how to, to deal with infinite sequences that would have Obsidian, for example or some of the documents are very long, and then it doesn't evaluate the, the full thing uh, as they are below uh, what, what Obsidian actually renders. I have some ideas on, on how to solve these things, but I, since this is not like a full-time project, I haven't quite uh, worked it out yet. Um, another thing that works, if you're familiar with Obsidian, you're probably familiar with DataView as well. Uh, so Obsidian Data View is another plugin where you can have you can have these documents with some data. So I have four documents here of, of four games that I sometimes play. Uh, so I have them tagged, 
I gave them a rating and how much time I've spent on these games. And now by that time, there are just documents, uh, but then you can query that data via data view. So here I have this table that will automatically change depending on uh, the data in the actual document. So with Wielder, you also can use the data view API just as you will be able to, to otherwise. Then in terms of other uh, examples, uh, you could, you can use the, the usual closure stuff that I use sometimes for designing like documents and, and architecture like multi-methods or, or protocols and stuff like that. Um, and then reagent here is one of the interactive applications is just a counter, for example. Uh, you could also use like intervals. So you can see that this, this here updates automatically. So every time uh, the every time the atom updates, the, the app re-renders. So it's just printing the current the current time. Uh, I mean the progress of like adding a to-do app directly in uh, Obsidian. So now it's just a list of to-dos that I have. Uh, but you could also add new documents and, and stuff like that. Uh, you could embed documents within each other. So, so this is a, a document that is included into uh, the current document. And then I can also use, uh, I can use them uh, in my, in the parent uh, document. And then in terms of like some other stuff I want to do, I want to add some more uh, flexibility to, to do like reusable functions across uh, documents. Uh, I also would like personally, at least to be able to have third party uh, dependencies. Uh, so someone can say, hey, I want, I want these uh, libraries to be available in my, in my vaults. So you, maybe you can have like a depths.elon uh, file where you specify dependencies and stuff like that. Um, so then, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. You can like publish this as, as websites. It's a, it's a part of uh, Obsidian, which is called Obsidian Publish. It basically just takes your vault, you select which files you want to publish, and, and then it goes live. And yeah, I, I would love to, to have people's feedback on, on things they would like to see in it, uh, if they find it useful, and uh, other great ideas of what, he, what it could be if we spend some, some time on it. Uh, so it's on it's on GitHub. I will I will throw a link in the in the meeting notes or wherever we put those links. Um, otherwise, I'm I'm open for questions. Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, of course. I have a couple of questions about that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, what's the relation between your uh, closure thing and obsidian do you kind of have a separate closure process running which is calling into the obsidian api or something like that no it's, it's actually much uh, simpler than this uh, so for uh, board loop uh, michael uh, yeah. has a, a c library or c s, -S yeah I, I i i know what you mean yeah, the so I'm, 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 I'm just compiling that to JavaScript and then okay. I'm just calling eval on that while you're keeping track of the context directly in uh, Obsidian. So Obsidian so, has its own way of calling JavaScript and you've compiled the, or you're using a, a the SCI interpreter within the thing so that, yeah. so it's, it's kind of driven by Obsidian's thing that's calling into the closure that you write. Yeah, inside the basically like um obsidian has some events that it sends out when you're changing the current view okay. or when you're editing the, the file. Uh, so what I am doing when my plugin is receiving those is that I'm I'm reading all the code blocks that I can find on the page and then I just okay. go one by one and evaluating them. I think there, there, there is probably a more clever way of like implementing it, uh, but I initially just did it for myself to, mm -hmm. to like uh, get a better interactive experience in Obsidian. Um, but then if, if more people come up with a better way of doing it, I'm, I'm completely open to that. Okay. okay. 
And just one other question about the publishing. When you publish, what, what do you get out of the publish process? Uh, so I think Obsidian Publish is like a, a closed source product from the Obsidian team. It's not okay. an open source uh, service that you run yourself, uh, but I think it's a way for them to get funding for... Uh, sure, sure. For so you entity. publish to their cloud, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, okay. can, I can show you, actually, if I can share my screen again. Let's see. So if I go to, to Obsidian, there is a command that is called publish. And you go there, you select which files you want to, you want to publish. So we take this one, for example, and then I publish it, and then that's it, right? They give you okay, a URL, cool. but you can also add like a custom domain. Like what I have is builder.mydomain, and then it goes there. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, as far as um, caching and not having to re um, reevaluate all of the code blocks, um, I know Clark has some built-in um, mechanisms to do that. And um, I know, although I think it's, it looks like Wielder's pure closure script, but... Uh, um, yeah, so it's it's side, I guess you would say it's like a, a different dialect, I guess, uh, in the end, right? okay. because it's like evaluating in its own way. Uh, so it's not really closure script. It's not really, really closure, although I'm using it via closure script. It's a bit right. of a, like a, <laughs> a hairball, you know. Um, but I, in the end, to answer like concretely your question, I'm just going and clearing the states every time it changes, and I go from the top to the bottom, evaluating everything uh, every time. So there is. Right. I was just saying that. Um, yeah. Clerk, Clerk has a built-in mechanism to cache different code blocks and to kind of keep an ID and keep the values. So when you change one, it only evaluates that block and all of its dependencies. So you still get kind yeah. of a consistent view. So you may be able to take some inspiration from that, although yeah. Clerk is in closure. So um, you may not be able to reuse the code, but we actually had a, um, a meeting previously where we went through the caching code. Mm -hmm. So that may I be interesting to look at. For sure. Um, I think the reason I just went with what I went was because I wanted something quick, right? And the initial idea was not even to publish anything. It wasn't until maybe a month. Yeah, it looks great. Like maybe some other people would like this too, uh, but it will be it will be nice to have like proper implementation where we, we don't constantly run like all the code on the top. So it's a good idea. Thank you for for putting it there. Yeah, that's cool. That's the it's interesting. I used to use Obsidian, but then I I gave up because I found the plugins too confusing. But uh, this maybe this would help. <laughs> um, I guess if that's all for now, we could move on to Phil, if you'd like to go ahead and present. This looks kind of cool. I'm excited to okay. hear about it. Right. So, well, basically, I think there's going to be a lot of overlap in a sense with the last one. And in fact, looking at all the presenters today, I kind of thought maybe this is just going to be a bork dude, um, you know, fan club, really, because pretty much everyone is is now using SI or SCI, the small closure interpreter stroke skittle i think this is clearly something that's that's revolutionizing the the community isn't it um so yeah so i'm going to talk about uh cardigan bay and i'm going to share my screen let me just uh get this up i need to get at the tabs come on i'm on that to go away here so um yeah there's a lot of overlap as as there's a lot going on at the moment in terms of these tools for thought uh digital gardening kind of tools and um in a sense this is my take on it and but you know obviously uh the wheel you know with, with obsidian is another one and of course there's a number of others so i guess most of you are sort of familiar with what's going on with these things like Rome, like Obsidian, like um, all that. Uh, and in a sense, what is Cardigan Bay? Cardigan Bay, uh, 
is a wiki type engine, but it's sort of evolving in the same direction. It's something that you can use as a personal note management tool. Um, it's got closure embedded in it. You can embed little closure scripts and you can publish a thing. So I, what I'd like to focus on maybe is uh, what I once called, I once wrote a kind of uh, tweet storm on, on Twitter, kind of saying, why is Cardigan Bay like that? So what are the kind of things that are slightly different from uh, everything? I mean, firstly, just, uh, just to check, everyone knows, I guess, what a wiki is, right? So anybody who doesn't know what a wiki is, maybe just shout and I can I can tell you. I'm assuming I'm assuming you all do do know that. So why what is Cardigan Bay? So so Cardigan Bay start and let, let me let me just do a little bit of personal history. Um that let me just pull that oh no down. Are you seeing a a window here or are you seeing my whole screen? Because I may need to change my screen sharing. Sorry, does anybody know if I can share my whole screen, not just one? Oh, yeah, this is the screen, isn't it? I think it should be possible. Yeah, if I do like that, you're yeah. seeing now something that's slightly smaller than the whole. Yeah, I think we're seeing right? your whole. You okay, see so I need to I need to go backwards and forwards between these um, tabs yeah. at the top here. <laughs> the thing is yeah, popping could... down. Yeah, uh, I hadn't hadn't thought of that. So I started off using, 20 years ago now, pretty much 2002, uh, using a copy of Use, uh, Use Mod Wiki. This is a, like a classic Perl-based online wiki. I kind of had a commute to create a, a wiki called ThoughtStorms. ThoughtStorms is something that started 20 years ago. It started with a number of people contributing to it. Over the years, well, the first thing that happened was it kind of started getting attacked by spam bots. Then somebody wrote a bot to kind of unroll the spam. Then, you know, everyone sort of migrated to other sorts of social media and it kind of went into a bit of decline. Uh, about 2012, Ward Cunningham, who's the guy that wrote the original wiki and sort of spawned that scene of people running wikis, came up with this thing called the smallest federated wiki, which was an attempt to rethink wikis instead of them being shared spaces which everybody uh, edited the same pages to being something where everyone had a, their own copy of the wiki a, a number of pages and then you federated or sort of synchronized between them in a process that was rather like git and uh, having multiple people working on multiple repositories and for a few years Thoughtstorms kind of my my wiki moved to that engine and then for various reasons I decided against it and I wrote my own engine in Python I thought Python would be very simple and then that was okay for a bit but I really wanted to work with Clojure so two years ago I decided I was actually going to write my own wiki engine to run Thoughtstorms in Clojure and so that's what I did I just picked up and so it's a mixture of Clojure as a the server or or um, the enclosure script for the client in the browser. So that's what we we have today. And the first thing to understand about it is because it comes from this wiki tradition, it's quite kind of old school in, in many ways, but it has this purpose of managing a wiki that's currently got about 6,000 pages in it. And they are kind of quite traditional pages, let's say, that were large blocks of text that originally had a lot of people contributing to them and um well you can see a sort of standard example here so this is the front page the hello world page is the the front page of a wiki and you can see some discussion about it and the first thing i decided to do was to break those large pages up into small pages so here you can see standard looking thing. You hit the edit. What you've got is a big text, is a standard text box. But the first idea I wanted to do was to move to having 
multiple cards, let's say. So I just repurposed this sort of standard line separator. This is all, all marked down as a card separator. So you can see that you get two cards within the, um, the page. And if we were to go to, uh, well, because if you look at something like Obsidian, you sort of start saying, well, you know, why, why do we have this rather old fashioned looking switch between uh, a text edit box and the, the published version? You can see here, I hit the button to edit it, I save it, it goes back. Now, this is a, a thing I decided I really wanted to keep. I didn't want to try to have a, a WYSIWYG type thing. And, and you'll see that that lets us, in my opinion, be more expressive because we can start putting the closure in. And it having a very explicit distinction between the edit mode and the publish mode, let's say, or the, the visible mode is something which lets us, uh, which I, uh, the way I describe it is that you can put something into that gap between the two, which is more sort of complicated if you try and do it on a piecemeal uh, scale. Because for example, in here, we can just put in say a piece of closure code that runs on the server. Let's say, um, let's do something like this, apply plus to range 10, this sort of thing. Uh, we need to convert this to a string, but and then when you save it, it just gets evaluated on the server. Um, and so, just let me, let me go. We've also got the ability to put in our closure up here. It's using the, the small closure interpreter. Apply the plus here. Hit the execute there. We get it into a, a transcript type thing. So the first the first kind of basic idea of here is, is that we have got a an old style wiki but we are going to start bringing in the ability to embed code and the inspiration for this is things like um jupyter notebook uh to an extent small talk i mean if you notice i call this the transcript because small talk has got this kind of interactive environment way so we can start to think of this as a place to experiment with trying out code so one of the things that is important about this is this is for working locally, but you want to publish your code on a, a live site, like let's say the Thorstorm's site here. And so the question I've had is how do you publish code which is being executed in the browser? So here is an example of. Um, a page which publishes some code. So if you were here, let me let me give you an example. I've got a I've got a page here. If you look inside it, it's just standard text, but we've got an example of something called a workspace. And the workspace here, you can actually see some code running. And, and the idea of this code is it knows how to draw a graph. And then we define a function, we apply it to some points, and then we graph it. So if you run it here, it will just graph that example of a function f squared. We could try putting in, say, a function like this over some other points. Run that, we'll get a different graph appearing here. And the this has been this has been working for a while, but the main thing that I've done now is that when we export it, uh, you get this static page coming out, and you've got the same functionality using Skittle, which is Bork Dude's JavaScript version of the small closure interpreter. So you can run the same code here. 
You can also run, say, something like this, where you're making a call to the JavaScript maths library and you'll get a sign function. This is one thing, I, if anyone knows how to, this is, this is a question I've currently got. Uh, I can't run this JS math sign function from inside this because in this version, I'm just using the small closure interpreter directly from the closure script, which is in the, uh, which is in the, the, that's running this whole user interface. And it just refuses to do anything. It doesn't see the, the math.sign the JS namespace for some reason. When I export it and I'm using um, Skittle, then it seems to see it fine. Because the thing to understand about this is this published page is a simply a flat HTML page with one dependency on Skittle. Everything else here, the, the code is all just um, embedded within that single page. So uh, just the other feature just to notice here, sorry, if I, if we look here, you can see all the code that, that knows how to actually draw the graph, right? There's no knowledge of the graph itself built into, built into this, or rather that it's simply there in this example code in the workspace. But there is this um, comment here where you just say public that divides what's going to be kept private and what's going to be kept public. So when you look at the published version of that, you only see the public bit. So the idea here is that within the context of a wiki, you've got a whole collection of pages and you might want to embed a little simulation or a little mathematical model. You don't want to give all the, the code of the model because that will just confuse the people reading the page. You just want to give them a simple API to it, like in this case of the graphing calculator, uh, define a function, apply it to some points, call the graphing function itself. Everything else is just sort of hidden behind the scenes. If someone wants to see it, they can see it, but we just keep it in a, a hidden input there. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot in Cardigan Bar. I wasn't going to show the whole thing today, just to show you kind of the status of um, where we are. I mean, if you've got other questions about it, maybe I'm not explaining the motivation. Well, I, I think the motivation is fairly clear. Uh, but yeah, so that's it. So if if you if you're starting off with a, a wiki that already has thousands of pages and you wanted to kind of bring it into this slightly update it and, and start allowing people to embed some some mathematical models or some simulations inside it, that's where that's what this is evolving towards. And it's giving you the ability to to embed closure within it. Uh, and it's all open source. It's all the other the other important features of this. Of course, you keep all your files just as markdown files on your local machine. I keep them all in Git so it can be synchronized between different machines. Um, and you can embed things like videos. So here was my launch thing. Um, yeah, any questions? I think that's pretty much what I what I need to show today. I do have a, a question. Um, you, ma you mentioned that s in, in some cases the code goes to a uh, backend and gets evaluated and, and sometimes you use inside. And, and when you're using it in this, so there's <laughs> the way I think of it, there's two modes, right? There's, there's this version that's running locally on my machine. Uh, and this is the live version where I'm editing it. Then there's also what happens when you publish it and you just get flat HTML files and you put that on the server somewhere anyway. So in this case, there are two ways you can embed. Uh, let me just create a new sandbox page here. There are two places you can, you can run code. You can run it on the backend server just by putting in um, code on server here. And you can run it in a code workspace so in this case, the code is run on the back end. And in this case, the code is run 
in the client. So they're both using the small closure interpreter, but there it's being called from the closure back end. Here it's being called from inside the closure script, which is running the, the front end. Okay. That answers my question. Sorry? No, that, that answers my question. That answers, yeah, I was just... Yeah, kind of. So there's actually three places. Like it runs on the back end on this. It runs in the workspace on the server. And then when it's published, when it's exported as flat files, it then it it, it's, it uses a slightly different mechanism each time. You know, here here it's closure. It's the small closure interpreter in closure. Here it's the small closure interpreter in closure script. And here it's the Skittle JavaScript version, you know, JavaScript library version of the small closure interpreter. I mean, I'm, it must be more or less the same. Although, interestingly, this seems to give me access to the the JS Math and namespace, and for some reason, I don't seem to have it here. And I'm still trying to figure out why that is. If anyone's got any ideas, anything else? Any other questions? was cool thanks for sharing right thank you it's still very much work in progress but it's you know it's all on github if anyone wants to to have a go with it and you can just download a sort of executable java file. you know it's all just in a jar file so it will run locally on pretty much anything no, I, nice. just just to put a, one of the other things that was really important for me creating this is that it runs on my tablet and my um phone so what I do is I run the um, user land small uh, Linux machine app on my phone and tablet, and you run it in this. And sometimes I describe myself as militantly one dimensional, right? I don't, everything here is just one single dimension, you know, sequence. Of things. There's nothing kind of laid out side by side. And one of the reasons for that is that this runs fine on a phone or anything else, as long as you're running the actual server in um, in the a virtual Linux machine. The actual interface is not very sophisticated, but it but it works equally well or equally badly, however you think about it, on pretty much anything, uh, which was a kind of important thing for me. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, just a quick note. Uh, if you look at the the link I sent to you on the in the Zoom chat, oh thanks. Yeah. I think you you might be able to resolve uh, the issue with the JS uh, global not being there. Oh, fantastic! Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. I think we have one more then, uh, Jacob. If you want to go ahead. Sure. All Last right. Time. Yeah, brilliant. brilliant. Wrap up. Okay, let me just share my screen. All right. So, um, so Platypub is what I'll be presenting. Um, here, I'll just show the GitHub page for that real quick, actually. Um, it's like platypus, but pub for like publish. Um, Platypub is a it's a tool for making blogs and newsletters. So I mean, it's a little bit in the same space as like WordPress, you know. Um, and and the the shortest way I usually describe it is it's it's meant to have kind of the same experience as you would have if you were um, like like doing a static website and rendering it with Clojure, but like I love having the flexibility of you, you know, using Hiccup and, and all those things and, and just writing out static files. It's a nice workflow. Um, and so I wanted so, like to be able to continue doing that to render my websites, but Platypub is an attempt to like create more of a web service and take some of the more um, more of the boring bits and factor them out. So you still have this theme system that uses Closure Babashka actually for rendering your websites. But then it's also more of like a, just a web app you can use and 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 things. So anyway, I'll just show you what it looks like. I have it running locally already. 
And actually, normally, if, if you weren't already signed in, you go to this kind of, this is a default sort of sign in page, which I haven't done anything with yet, but I'm already logged in actually. So I'll just go directly here. Um, and, and yeah, I'll just go through the app a little bit and then I'll talk a tiny bit about the background afterward. So this is, um, so yeah, so this is Platypub. There are basically three sections. There's a CMS, so posts where you can get like a WYSIWYG editor. So like here it is, this is a, a email I sent out to one of my lists announcing this meeting actually. Um, and then also another little meetup we're doing next week. Um, and so, you know, you can write your post in here and then have metadata and things and, and save the post, you know, fairly standard. And you can have some tags, which are, I'll explain how those are used in a second. Um, so yeah, nothing too earth shattering. Um, once you've written some posts, you can go over here and do sites. So, so one of the things about Platypub is that as, as opposed to say Word, WordPress, for example, you know, you have one instance of WordPress, which correlates to like one website with Platypub, it's meant to be able to handle like all of your posts, all of your websites in one place. If you happen to have multiple, I, I have a few, I still have more I need to migrate over here into Platypub. But anyway, so with posts, you have just all the posts for all your websites and you use tags to say like what website each post is for. So like Biff, um, this is a website for a web framework I've made. Um, and Platypub also is built with Biff. Platypub actually, half of it is because I wanted Platypub for my own use and the other half is because I wanted more of a in-depth example project built with Biff so that if people are interested in learning Biff, they can say like, well, here, here's like a, a real, working project you can take a look at if you like. Um, so when you make a site here, I'll just show you like creating a new one. Um, it'll start out with some some default fields here and you can you know put in the configuration values and things. And the way this works for publishing is so here's another difference from like WordPress or something. Um, it Platypub itself will not host the website. Platypub is just kind of like a headless CMS is the term we use. Um, so you edit your posts in Platypub, but then you deploy them to Netlify. Um, so again, kind, kind of actually the same, a similar workflow to if you're using a static site generator where you, you know, maybe editing it in Markdown on your, your local machine, and then you push it to like GitHub pages or something. That's basically what Platypub does. Um, and let's see. So so yeah, so I've, I've got a couple, oh yeah, and here's this website I just made, like we don't have anything in it. So I'll just go delete that. Um, but so like I mentioned, I have two websites built with Platypub already. Um, and, and so this first one, the sample, the sample is my, my little startup that I've been working on for a while. And so this is, I'm using this for a blog website for the sample. And so to show you what that looks like, um, Platypub comes with a default theme, and a theme is basically just a script. Um, when you preview or publish a site, Platypub will take all of your blog posts and then write them all to an EDN file. And then the theme is a Babashka script. In fact, let me just show you that real quick. Um, yeah, I'll zoom in and turn it. Um, so theme, so Platypub comes with this default theme and the main file here is render site. And so this is just a Babashka file and we use hiccup for rendering things and, and have a handful of functions here to write various parts of the website. And so it'll read in all your posts from this input.edn file um, and then spit them out to the local directory. Um, and, then, and then you can view them in your browser and publish them to Netlify. Uh, so, so anyways, okay, so yeah, so going back to this site, this is using the default theme. Um, there are some configuration values, so I can put in like, like here, let me show you if, so a theme, by the way, here is where you specify it, there's default. Um, and we could change, say, change the accent color to red. And then maybe I'll save the site configuration and then hit this preview button. And this will take a couple seconds, shouldn't be super long. 
And so this is rendering the site with Babash and also running Tailwind CSS. And so now the accent color, that's what that originally was this green color now it's red. So over here, you know, there you go. Um, and so let's see. So, so yeah, so that's basically sites. And then the last bit of it is that you can also do newsletters, which I think is very important because um, you know, it's fairly standard to have like an RSS feed on your blog, right? Um, but there, especially if you're trying to reach a non-programmer audience, a lot of people just don't use RSS, but pretty much everyone uses email. So I think it, it's, in my opinion, it's very nice to be able to provide both of those. So, you know, however people would like to subscribe, they can do it. Um, so here, like, so let's see. So yeah, so this is the newsletter that I've, that goes along with this, the sample blog here. Um, similarly to how like Platypub itself doesn't host the site we're using, that will fire we do the same for newsletters. So we're using Mailgun here. Um, so you can, you can create a newsletter here and here just a couple, you know, configuration fields. We do the same kind of thing for the theme. So, so like I mentioned, there's a Babashka script, which will write out all these HTML files and things for your website. We have another Babashka script, which will take individual posts and then it will write it to an HTML file, which you can send as an email. Um, and the way you do that is, so like, so for example, this announcement post is this little send button right here. Um, and if you go here, then we've got the, the post we've selected. You can choose what newsletter you want to send it to. Um, and, and here, I'll just, I'll, I won't send it because I already sent it to the list, and, and, but I'll hit this preview button here. And so this is what the output of that Babashka script would look like. Um, and so if you want, you can, you know, if you wanted to tweak how something looks, you could, you know, this is the script, the Babashka script. And so you can edit things and then just like refresh this page or hit preview again and then see if it looks how you like. And then we have kind of the standard things you can, you know, put in your email address and send yourself a test version before you send it out to the whole list. Um, and that is pretty much it. There is one little page here that Jeff actually added the other day that to show your subscriber list, um, which is all your subscribers are stored in Mailgun. I would show it to you, except that would be exposing the email addresses of all my subscribers, so I'll refrain from doing that. Um, but so yeah, that is Platypub. There, I, I have a couple more minutes to talk. Uh, I'll cover some a tiny bit more about the background and some open issues and things. But before we go on to that, anyone have any questions, anything? want to discuss about this just one question how uh presumably this just talks to a standard email server then to send the email out is that right uh not no not a like it, it's not using the smt protocol um right. it's using so mailgun specifically and so mailgun has their own uh api okay so it's using the mailgun api yeah, yeah thanks yeah also, well, also Oh yeah, go on. Oh, sorry. I was just curious. Is this um, all? Would this be all self-hosted at the moment, or is this something you're offering as like a like you know subscription thing that you host or whatever and sign up for? Yeah. At the moment, it is self-hosted. I am so, planning to do it as a managed service. There are some complications. Um, that's a headache. That will take sure. to get there. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. That, that is that is the plan. That's cool though. So it's so it's all open source. So like if someone wanted to, you could deploy this on your own like little droplet somewhere or whatever and, and just have it up and running. Yeah, and and actually, oh yeah, that's a good point. I should mention. So Platypub is built so you don't need to have it running even on a droplet. You can just run it on your local machine. Um, oh, that's cool. Get, yeah, because because all the parts of it that are public facing are handled by external services. Um okay. Including, for example, like like this this email sign up form is so I mentioned the sites hosted on Netlify. So one of the things that the Babashka script does is is it will write out some some serverless functions because Netlify can can do like simple backend JavaScript things. So this okay. is let me. So how does 
So it's all local yeah. and then it generates like the static website that you would deploy then. And then I guess it's also, if you wanna, if you're gonna send an email, you have the app running locally and then you press send and, and like just from your local machine, it calls Mailgun and, and sends it off. Yeah. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's cool. So yeah. so yeah, so this is an example of like, this is a little, so subscribe.js right. file. And so this is like what the bash code publishes to Netlify and, and so this will handle like taking the form input and then handing it off to Mailgun. And like, yeah, yeah, and Netlify can handle those like sort of simple form submissions or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And, and I mean, you can you can do more complex websites in Netlify too. I I personally just like normal closure backend, so I, I tend to just use this kind of thing for some stuff, but. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I'm all about the static static websites. Totally makes sense for like just information websites. It's a bummer to have a something running twenty four seven. Yeah. It's also also another nice thing about that is that um, theoretically, like if if once I do get this to the point where I'm providing it as a managed service, I don't have. It should be much easier to handle multiple users because then Platypub doesn't actually have to handle any of the traffic like if anyone happens to have like a high traffic website right right it's just kind of you know give it off to notify and and should be easy yeah cool how i guess sorry one other question it says so like you're signed in what is it yeah. is it is that like a some custom auth thing or using like auth zero or something like that yeah, so it's custom. It's fairly simple. Um, it is so. I, yeah, so I, it's it's the standard authentication that Biff provides actually in the framework, um, and so it's done via email link. So oh, if cool. if you've like so normally for any Biff project, if you set up like a, a an account like Mailgun for sending emails, you can put that in, and then you know you sign in, send your email, click on the link. Um, by default, if you don't have that set up, it'll just print out to your console. So like if you were to go and clone Platypub and run it on your local machine, you, you could just you know sign in and then go switch to your terminal and click a link there and, and sign okay. in from there. Cool, cool. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'll just go just super briefly over. Let's go back to the GitHub profile here or the GitHub page. Um, so yeah, so like, so like I mentioned, this is, Half of the reason I built this is kind of an example project for Biff, um, and so what I'm I'm trying to provide an open source project that's written in Biff. So if anyone wants to, um, you know, get their feet wet with Biff, they, there's a project here they can start working on. And so we have I've purposefully for that reason tried to refrain from um, polishing it too much. So you might have noticed like a lot of it is is sort of janky, like like we like in the site configuration, for example, it actually let me show the other one. It'd be nice if we had better components, like instead of just putting in hex values, like um, you know, nice to have like a color picker component and, and things like that. And there's so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here for um updating things. And so we have a list of issues here. So like, right. like better, you know, tags and date time picker image component, those things. Or another issue here is this is a, a fairly simple one for just um, inferring some data on the back end it should be like a couple line changes. So so I'm trying to have a nice list of like fairly easy to get into issues that so if you are wanting to get into an open source project or, or write some code for something that's kind of an easy on-ramp. Um, oops. The other side of this, so like I mentioned, yeah, part of the long-term plan is to have this hosted as managed service. I have this roadmap. And this is going forward, this is what I'm planning to focus my own efforts on. Um, some of these are a little bit more complicated. So right now we're at like stage one, which is, you know, you just run it on your local machine, you know, use it as a single person. Um, the next couple stages. Yeah, actually, actually, two, three, and four are all for like changing it. So you know, you have a managed service. You can just start using it. You don't have to add your own API keys. Um, the main complications there is is one one, especially for sending emails. It's kind of a headache because then you have to worry about potential spammers, and so you have to have someone who wants to 
you know, monitor that, which is not something I particularly want to do at the moment. The biggest complication is with custom themes because the a big part of Pop is trying to have this theme system be extremely flexible and where you know you're just writing, you know, just about bash with script, right? However, if you have a managed service running on something with multiple users, that would be just a, a terrible security flaw, right? Um, so, so the way that works is, or it will need to work is we need a sandbox at some power. So at the moment it's not sandbox, so we can't really have a managed service with multiple people until we figure out a way to, you know, run your theme code and, and some kind of something. Um, but anyway, so that is the plan. That's Platypub. Um, any other questions or things? All right, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for sharing. So yeah, I guess that kind of wraps up our like scheduled uh, presentations or whatever. But um, yeah, anyone, if anyone wants to stick around and ask questions or um, just chat or talk about anything else, uh, feel free. But I guess we could probably um, kind of close down the recording pretty soon. I don't know. What do you think, Daniel? Anything else worth mentioning? I guess like maybe worth mentioning we do this like every what every couple of weeks or once a month ish. Um, so if you ever have anything like this that you want to share with the community, um, it's it's wide open. Uh, and you can find all these people on various places on the internet, GitHub, Closureverse, or maybe the Closure Slack. Um, whatever. So we'll post like a, an update in a few days about all the stuff we talked about here and where to find all the projects and all the people and everything like that. Um, so I think that's all.